Bear with us for a minute. That's Vice Mayor Steele. Good to go. Let me call this session of the Santa Cruz City Council on February 28th, 2023 to order and ask the clerk to call the roll. Thank you, Mayor. Councilmember Newsom? Present. Brown? Here. Councilmember Watkins is currently absent. Um, Bruner? Present. Kalantari Johnson? Present. Vice Mayor Golder? Here. And Mayor Keeley? Here. Having established a quorum, we'll move forward on our agenda today. Uh, I am going to ask for public comment, either from anyone who is with us today or is online, who would like to comment on the closed session agenda. While folks may be thinking about that, we have on our closed session agenda four items. Uh, one relates to labor negotiation, one to anticipated litigation, one to existing litigation, and one regarding a number of liability claims. This would be the opportunity if you wish to address the council on these closed session items to do so. Ms. Bush, do we have anyone online with us? Nobody with their hand up, no. No one with their hands up, and I'll make one more call here. Uh, it doesn't appear that we have anyone with us in chambers today who wishes to make comments on closed session. Uh, that being the case, what we will do is we will adjourn into closed session to take up those items. Uh, we will return uh, and report on those, and uh, we will turn return on uh, uh, at, uh, at or before 2.45 p.m. this afternoon. We stand in recess into closed session. The hour of 2.45 having arrived, we will resume our work as the City Council on February 28th, 2023. The clerk will call the roll. Thank you, Mayor. Councilmember Newsom? Present. Brown? Here. 
Council Member Watkins is currently absent. Bruner? Present. Kalantari Johnson? Present. Vice Mayor Golder? Here. And Mayor Keeley? Here. We, uh, what we are going to do now is a sad but informed moment for us. Uh, as many of you know, some years ago, but too fresh in our memories was the loss of uh, Butch Baker and Elizabeth Butler, two Santa Cruz police officers in the line of duty, which still has cleaved a space in our hearts in this city. We love them, we love the work that they did, their families, and we are going to have a moment of silence for them, but just before we do that, I would invite the chief to the microphone for a moment, sir. Good afternoon, chief. Good afternoon, Mayor. Um, Mayor Keeley, Council, uh, thank you for, for taking the time to <clears throat> honor uh, both Butch and Elizabeth. Um, as you know, we, we had a wonderful ceremony for them on Sunday. Um, and I just really want to uh, acknowledge the, the support from the community. Uh, it really means a lot to our department and our staff. Uh, to stay strong, um, you know, February 26th, 2013 changed a lot of lives forever. Um, and so we try to recognize the families of Butch and Elizabeth and support our staff that um, some still struggle. So uh, it's real, um, but the support makes all the difference. So I appreciate this, this time and, uh, and all of your support. Thank you. Those who are able, if you would stand for a moment of silence. God bless you, Butch and Elizabeth. We are on item number five, which is another sad moment, but important moment of recognition. Uh, this is the marking the one year time frame uh, following the invasion of Ukraine by the Russian army and government. Uh, this city has a close and enduring relationship with Ukraine. One of our sister city relationships is with Alushta, which sadly at this moment is under Russian occupation. Uh, Tatiana Burdak, Burdiak was uh, kind enough to contact uh, our city and the office of the mayor to request that we adopt a proclamation recognizing the terrible pain and suffering that the Russian government has inflicted upon the people of Ukraine, men, women, and children, civilians as well as combatants, uh, and for us to take a moment and really think about what that means. And uh, I would like to walk down here and present to Tatiana a proclamation from the city and invite you to make some remarks, if you would. Thank you very much. My name is Tatiana Berdiak. I am a second generation Ukrainian American and a local Santa Cruz resident. I am here as a citizen and representative for the Ukrainians living throughout Santa Cruz County 
and for the displaced Ukrainians now living here caused by this horrific and unprovoked invasion. My story is like many other Ukrainians in the diaspora. I grew up going to Ukrainian Saturday school, singing folk songs around a bonfire, Ukrainian dancing, playing Ukraine's national instrument, the bandura, making pierogies, halipsi, borscht, doing shots of vodka at the dinner table, and delighting in all the delicious food ways passed down from my ancestors. And in these past 369 days, I now understand that my childhood and upbringing was a carefully contrived preservation strategy from generations of ancestral oppression and genocide to keep our Ukrainian identity, language, culture, and art from being eradicated. The last year has shown the relentless will and unwavering spirit of Ukrainians. And the world has witnessed our determination to defend our freedoms, democracy, and independence. Thank you, Honorable Mayor Keeley and Santa Cruz City Council for this proclamation of solidarity with Ukraine. And thank you to every single person in our community that has shown and continues to express their support in the last year. I see Ukrainian flags throughout neighborhood streets on my walks. I've seen local businesses donate their profits to humanitarian aid in Ukraine. And so many of you have stepped in to support Ukrainians in any capacity. We see you, we thank you, and we love you. Please continue to amplify the voices of Ukrainians and share and support Ukrainian dance, art, and food as a form of activism, resistance, and cultural preservation. And much like my family's history, I'm determined to keep them alive and well here in Santa Cruz, too. Slava Ukraini, Heroyam Slava. Glory to Ukraine and glory to the heroes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for being here. Thank you. We are on item number five, presiding officer announcements. There are none to be made. Statements of disqualification. This would be the opportunity for council members who may have a disqualifying circumstance to make that announcement. Seeing and hearing none, we will move to additions and deletions to the agenda. Do we have additional documents or items? Ms. We do Clark? not, no. We do not. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Condotti, this would be the opportunity for you to report on any reportable closed session items. Yes, good afternoon, Mayor Keeley, members of the City Council. This afternoon, the Council met in closed session at 1.30 in the Courtyard Conference Room to uh, consider the following items. <clears throat> Item one was a conference with labor negotiators. The Council met with its negotiating team uh, concerning three bargaining groups, the Police Officers Association, Police Management Association, and SEIU Temporary Employees. <clears throat> Item two was a conference with legal counsel involving anticipated litigation. Council uh, received a report from the city attorney's office on one potential uh, litigation item. Item 3.1, conference with legal counsel, existing litigation, uh, the case Don't Morph the Wharf versus the City of Santa Cruz was removed from the agenda prior to the meeting and was not discussed. Item 3.2, case of Destiny Rogers versus Nicole Adamo et al. Currently pending in the Santa Cruz County Superior Court. The, the council by motion uh, approved unanimously a direction to the city attorney's office to file a cross complaint in that case against uh, a current defendant, Santa Cruz Pacific Associates. Item four was a conference with legal counsel concerning liability claims. Uh, the claimants were Mochi Zhu, Josiah Justin Gran, April R. Laird, Capital Insurance Group, and Brian Todd Schulman. There was no action taken on those claims, but they are also listed on your afternoon consent calendar for uh, council action. That concludes my report. Thank you. 
Thank you very much. Ms. Bush, do you have any uh, reports on uh, up-to-dates to our meeting calendar? Um, I do not, know. Thank you. Members, we are on the consent agenda. Uh, this is an item which includes a wide range of items. This is council agenda items 7 through 20 on our agenda, which will all be taken up in one motion unless one of those items is pulled by a council member. You, by the way, thank you for coming. You really don't need to stay with me. <laughs> <laughs> but, but thank you very much, and God bless Ukraine. Thank you. Uh, this would be the opportunity at this moment uh, for anyone who wishes to comment on our items. We will get to that in just a second. Uh, I want to see if any member of the city council wishes to pull an item from tonight's, excuse me, this afternoon's consent agenda, Ms. Bruner. Uh, I just have a quick clarifying question on number four. Certainly. Question. Certainly. Thank you. Go ahead. Why don't you go ahead and do that now? Um, so item number 12 on a Item number 12 on the consent agenda is the living wage rate annual prescription for fiscal year 2024 under the finance department. Um, we received some correspondence from a member of the public um, regarding uh, a statement that living wage is falling behind the actual minimum wage changes and um, is asking that we increase minimum wage um, based on CPI. But my understanding was that our living wage is well in excess of, of the minimum wage. So I just wanted to get that clar clarity if someone from finance department could speak to that. Good afternoon. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yes, thank you. Okay, wonderful. Uh, good afternoon, Mayor and Council Members. Uh, Elizabeth Milby purchasing manager in the finance department. Um, I, I think it's important to make the distinction in answering uh, the question that came in between the living wage annual prescriptive index update um, that applies to contracts uh, with the city of Santa Cruz that are over $10,000 and the uh, statewide minimum wage rate, which is something that is um, controlled at that state level. Um, our living wage rate currently is at um, $20 and 22 cents is the is what's put before you for this increase. And then $22 and six cents, the minimum wage rate at the state level is at $15 and 50 cents. Um, so we are um, above above that rate. Thank you so much. Thank you. Councilmember Kalantari Johnson, I believe you had an item about which you had a question. Is a, that correct? A comment. A comment, certainly. Should I go now? Please. No? All right. So this is on um, item nine, which is authorizing authorization for application and acceptance of California Interagency Council on Homelessness Grant Funds for Encampment Resolution Funding Program Round Two. Um, I just wanted to um, thank staff for working on this application. I was pleased to see that we're continuing our work and helping those who are unhoused in our community. I mean, I know we're working across the jurisdictions in our county and, and hoping that we're encouraging other jurisdictions to provide similar uh, crisis support. Um, and in that vein, I would like to ask that we invite county staff to speak to some of their work and specifically uh, implementation of some of the state legislation that's come down um, and specifically care courts that we all have to uh, abide by very soon here. So um, a request to invite county staff to come and present us with the implementation plan and other efforts around crisis response to unhoused. At a future meeting. At a future meeting, not right. today. Very good. <laughs> Thank you. Well, yeah, let's entertain that. Sounds wonderful. Uh, and, and that will be added. Uh, as additional direction on this item, we will request that in, in a timely manner. Very good, thank you. Ms. Brown. I would, I would echo those comments from my colleague, uh, Council Member Kalantari Johnson. And I, I also just wanted to ask on this one because um, 
I it wasn't clear to me how much we're applying for, um, and I just wanted to I imagine that it's in process. And so I, I don't need a definitive answer there, but I just wanted to see if we could get a sense of, you know, what, what what's going into that application. Not a over, real detailed overview, but just Mr. Wally, Good afternoon. Thanks. Uh, good afternoon, Mayor and members of the council. I'm happy to provide a little more insight on that. Um, yes, we didn't have it available uh, at the time of the agenda report. The application we were seeking six point two million dollars over two years. Uh, and really the, the crux of the funding request is to support our outreach team um, and to provide, um, underwrite uh, approximately half of the shelter costs the city overlook, as well as augment that with case management that would be provided by a nonprofit organization. Thank you so much. Anyone else on the consent agenda? This would be the opportunity for anyone to address the council uh, on any item on the consent agenda. Let me ask if there's anyone with us in chambers this afternoon who would like to do so. Seeing and hearing none, Ms. Bush, do we have anyone online who wishes to do so? Um, nobody currently with their hand raised. We do have people. Okay, but, but perhaps not on this item. All right, very good. Uh, the appropriate motion would be to adopt the consent agenda with the additional direction provided by Ms. Kalantari Johnson. Is there such a motion? Motion by Ms. Watkins, a second by uh, Ms. Kalantari Johnson. Uh, is there a debate or discussion? Seeing and hearing none, we will move to a vote and the clerk will call the roll. Council Member Newsom? Aye. Brown? Aye. Uh, Watkins? Aye. Brunner? Aye. Kalantari Johnson? Aye. Vice Mayor Golder? Aye. And Mayor Keeley? Aye. Motion carries by unanimous vote and so ordered. We are on item 21. And this is a, excuse me for just a moment, just for a moment, please. Thank you. We are on file item number 21 and 22. These are public hearings on file item 21 and 22 on our agenda. If anyone wishes to address us on either of these items, this would be the opportunity to do so. Seeing and hearing no one present in council chambers, let me ask if members have questions or comments on either of these two items. Seen and hearing none, Ms. Bush, do we have anyone online who wishes to make comments? We do not. A motion to, we will close the public hearing. The matter is back before the council. Is there a motion to approve? I'll move the public hearing consent agenda. Ms. Brown moves the public hearing portion of the consent agenda, which is items 21 and 22. Is there a second? There is a second. I by, second. By council member Bruner. Is there debate or discussion? Seeing and hearing none, the clerk will call the roll. Council Member Newsom? Aye. Brown? Aye. Watkins? Aye. Bruner? Aye. Kalantari Johnson? Aye. Vice Mayor Golder? Aye. And Mayor Ku. Aye. Motion carries and so ordered. Members, we are on item number 23 under general business. Uh, this is West Cliff Drive update, temporary traffic control efforts and traffic control next steps. We have items in our packet on this item. Members of the public, you can access that. We have with us uh, Ms. Schmidt and Mr. Nguyen, who will be presenting on this item. Good afternoon. Thank you, Mayor. We are trying to get the presentation set up so we can also see the tiles. Uh, 
I'm Laura Schmidt, your Assistant City Manager, and with me co-presenting today is Nathan Nguyen, your Public Works Director. Thank you so much for having us. We are very excited to give you an overall update on West Cliff, as well as um, seek your direction and approval for some specific next steps for West Cliff. One of the things that we're doing as an internal citywide team is approaching West Cliff holistically as one of our great city treasures and an asset, and it's not a public works issue, it's not a climate issue, it's not a recreation issue. It is an asset and something that we want to make resilient and accessible to all. So the team has been amazing in changing our paradigm and shifting in this regard. And when we step back and look at what has happened with the end of December and early January um, atmospheric rivers and the resultant surge and damage to our West Cliff area, we realized that we needed to really take an integrated and collaborative approach to West Cliff. And you'll notice that we consciously in the agenda report and starting to move forward, refer to it as West Cliff. And when we have specific actions and projects related to the road, we will refer to it as West Cliff Drive. So West Cliff is extremely critical and important to us as a community, and it has changed. With the extensive damage that happened as a result of the storm surge, um, we cannot promise, nor would it be responsible for us to say that it is going back to be the way that it is. Change is afoot. And the damage that happened was so extensive that we hit um, thresholds that we weren't expecting to hit for several decades. And those thresholds are triggering actions that we thought we had longer to take. So now that we're in this situation, we're going to have to balance a lot of competing needs and interests and make some difficult choices. And I like to use the word choices versus decisions because de de decisions are definite, but choices can be definite, but they also give us the ability to learn from the choice and make adjustments and do what we need to do next. Because as we've seen, Mother Nature doesn't really give us the time sometimes to be able to say, okay, this is the path, this is where we're going. Well, that may not work out given what happens with an atmospheric river or any other natural erosion or our important or um, devastating climate event that may happen. So with this um, integrated collaborative approach, we are stepping back and saying, what are the main things that we need to keep top of mind? We have safety, we have accessibility to the area, and as you saw from the previous slide, that could be residents, that could be vehicle, that could be pedestrian, and that can be um, bike. So there's a lot of different ways to access it and for recreation or other uses. We have to consider the environment. We have to consider the community of West Cliff and those neighbors and those neighborhoods immediately adjacent. And the fact that there are a lot of people coming from that community and outside of the community and over the hill and from other countries to be able to recreate and enjoy this amazing space that we have. And then, as I said earlier, it is basic transportation, and it is a way from getting from point A to B as well. So that is, I think, the best description that we were trying to convey to the council and the community of how we're approaching West Cliff as an overall project and a gem to be able to figure out how we keep this accessible and resilient over the next decades. And with that, um, I'll talk about the scope of what the work look like, looks like for us. In your agenda report, we've broken it up into four different areas, just for ease of conversation. We have an emergency protective measure that we had to put in place as a response to the damage that happened in West Cliff and on West Cliff Drive. So we need your after the fact ratification of that emergency protective measure. Additionally, because of the extensive damage, there are a lot of emergency and urgent repair and recovery work that need to happen, and that will be described as well. And then within that urgent response, 
We are also asking for council direction on the possibility of a one-way pilot for Westcliff. Additionally, moving forward, items areas three and four, pathways and roadmap and a prioritized plan, those are more forward-looking. So the first two are immediate response and urgent response, and the next ones for the pathways and options and a prioritized plan. That takes the legacy of all the master planning and decades of resiliency work, transportation work, and general plan work to be able to put, a, put it all together, say this is what it, where we are now, given these very intense, destructive storms that we experience, and how do we move forward? And how do we fund that in a methodical, planful way? So that's how we're going to break up the conversation with you all today. For the first two items, I'm going to hand it over to Nathan. And then keep in mind, this is very; um, these are very tactical things that we need to talk about in the public works space. And that is not all that is Westcliff. And then we will transition to the bigger picture, longer-term strategic roadmap and pathways process and the prioritization of a plan to move forward after that. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to Nathan. Ms. Schmidt, thank you. Mr. Nguyen, good afternoon, sir. Yep. Good afternoon, Mayor, Council members, members of the public. Nathan Nguyen, uh, Public Works Director, City of Santa Cruz. Thank you, Laura, for uh, that introduction. Uh, I started off with the first slide and I wanted to take us back um, to the recent atmospheric river uh, storm swell events that occurred both on December 31st and on January 4th and subsequent um, events that happened after that. Because of those recent um, uh, events, Westcliff sustained uh, quite a bit of damage, um, in particular on, if you can view on the slide here, at site locations uh, number two, number three, uh, number five, and number six. This image actually comes to us from USGS. Um, they've been partners with us. They were actually able to take a aerial photo image before and after the storm events. And so they gave us a rough estimation of how much riprap was displaced with those recent storm events. So as you can see uh, on the slide there, roughly 5,000 tons of riprap were displaced as a part of those recent storm events. Those, a few of those locations um, received sustained uh, extensive damage because there was no coastal arming, we actually had three projects in our CIP to perform um, revetment projects out there that were supposed to be performed later this summer, potentially into the next year, but unfortunately Mother Nature uh, came quicker than we could uh, get those, those projects implemented. And so that's kind of the current situation that we um, have on Westcliff. And as a part of that emergency response effort, the emergency protection measures that Laura had mentioned, we, uh, Public Works, uh, along with other city staff, Parks and Rec, and, and it's been a collaborative effort to put out those protective measures to um, essentially put water barriers around some of the failed re, uh, failures around Westcliff and to reopen it to the public, uh, which is what you currently see on, let's see on this next slide here. So these are the emergency temporary traffic control measures that were put in place uh, around the middle of January. And essentially what we've done here uh, is to do a one-way uh, vehicle traffic on westbound from Columbia to Woodrow on Westcliff. The Bethany Curve Covert was not originally an RCIP project, but it did sustain uh, quite a bit of damage. And so um, going out there with structural engineering team or geotech that we also had on board, uh, we decided to close that to the public, but still keep it open for two-way pedestrian and uh, bicycle traffic. The other location that's shown in purple here um, has a one, uh, is still open to the public, uh, to the homes. Uh, adjacent to West Cliff right there. But of course, vehicle traffic has to stop at, at Bethany Curve Culvert. And so we instituted a temporary traffic control plan with detour signs to uh, detour the public onto Almar Street and Delaware Street, as well as onto Woodrow and Pelton. So that's currently what's in place today. I think with that, I think we'll hand it over back to Laura. Thank you, Nathan. Um, so part of the action today is to have you ratify this emergency protective measure that is on this slide, as well as potentially give us direction for a next step underneath the emergency or urgent recovery and repair work. So in this eye chart, um, at, the, at the top part of it is the emergency protective measure that is currently in place. That was the preceding slide, and we're seeking your ratification that um, that is okay at this point. On the next 
bar chart, the emergency or urgent repair work and federal funding, that is just an indication for you that we have started that work as of January and staff across the city, be it Parks and Rec, Public Works, Fire, the city manager's office, and finance are in the process of filing all of the paperwork that we need with the federal agencies in order to get approval for the work done as well as to um, be eligible for reimbursement later. So that process is ongoing, it's already started. It will take months and probably even years for us to complete that. It's, it's, a, it's a lot of fun. Um, the other consideration for you that, we, that staff is asking for direction as part of this recovery work, given the extensive damage and the exceeding of those thresholds and having hit triggers that we thought were decades away, we now have a very different physical structure out there in Westcliff, and we're asking for your direction to pilot a one-way. So to move away from the emergency protective measure and actually do a pilot of a one-way on Westcliff. So we're seeking council direction to be able to do that. We have already reached out to the California Coastal Commission, and they graciously agreed to meet with us last week. And they had given us direction that we could do the one-way pilot underneath an emergency coastal development permit. So with that direction, if you launch us today, we could then go to the, the Transportation and Public Works Commission with an informative sharing and, and getting feedback from the Transportation and Public Works Commission. Since it's an emergency coastal development permit, I'll call that an ECDP, we do not have to go to the Planning Commission. We could do the design and the, through community outreach, engineering, professional services support, and staff expertise, and then return to you, Council, for approval of a design and next steps in May. So that's the overall process that we're seeking your feedback on. As far as the community outreach and the one-way um, pilot itself, we have left the direction open to have you um, direct us as staff to go out and explore, look at basically looking at best practices, having staff weigh in and um, amalgamate and consolidate all of the different master plans that are out there, use engineering services consulting work, and then community outreach to inform the path of the one way and the design and the parameters of it. So that's why it is worded the way it is today. How do we get community outreach for this potential one-way pilot? Um, we have designed community connection paths. We have existing pathways where we have a lot of our staff who already go to different avenues, whether that's Tiffany talking to um, existing groups in our community, whether that's our participation on existing boards and commissions and other agency work, we will continue to leverage those. We will add pop-ups to that, where especially our transportation staff will be out there on Westcliff and on Westcliff Drive in some handy dandy like bright yellow fluorescent vests so they're easily identifiable to be able to speak to the community in sight and in there and be available for questions and answers and also go out to neighborhoods and smaller groups and speak with them directly. We're also going to be doing surveys and taking advantage of basically any ad hoc mechanism that we think can leverage a, a direct conversation with the community. So that's what we're calling the community connections. In addition to that, we will be doing specific community outreach events. And we want to do those at minimally two in March, should you give us this direction to do the one-way pilot, and then working with the input and feedback through the connections and those specific events to be able to work with the engineering consulting firm to put together some options and a design, go back to the community for a checkpoint in May prior to then coming to council for the actual review of the design with you. So that is overall what we're looking at at a high level for the community outreach piece of it. I also put on this chart just as an informational context piece for you, the fact that throughout this process, staff will be 
actively and avidly meeting with community, with regulatory partners, whether that's the California Coastal Commission, my chair just dropped, like I'm not short enough as it is, um, with, the, with the California Coastal Commission, with the Army Corps of Engineers, with FEMA, and anybody else that we can talk to to get some help and insight as to how to best go about these changes. So that's ongoing work that happens day in and day out. And then also I have the California Coastal Commission meetings because we very much appreciate their partnership and they meet once a month. And should we need to be able to go to them for, because of regulation and process, to get approval for something, we have these bites at the pie. And then we also have a backlog of quite a, a long list of California Coastal conversations to have outside of West Cliff. So we have the general plan, we have ordinances, we have other projects that are going on that all those need to go to Coastal as well. So just wanting to put that together as context. Nathan, anything to add here? If I may, I just wanted to add that under the ECDP and working with Coastal Commission is that it does allow for a pilot program that isn't static. It would allow for staff, if approved today, to proceed with a pilot program that we could work with various designs or ideas through the process. So uh, if we, it's not just one design that has to be implemented and stay that way. Um, underneath that emergency permit, there's a, there is a lot of um, autonomy which is uh, built into that. Great. Additionally, as we move into those more forward-looking aspects of our scope that I spoke about, I wanted to give you an idea of the process that we're envisioning for the pathways and roadmap. One of the things that we've also done is hired a partner in this journey, um, their Farallon strategies. So they are very much focused on climate change and marrying their knowledge of climate to and helping communities be more resilient. And they're also not just scope of resiliency, but they also understand a lot about funding channels and mechanisms and creatively being able to tap into the horsepower of other agencies and the re regulatory world that is out there and helping us navigate that a little bit more easily. So I just wanted to put that plug in there that we are working with Farallon. So, the context that we have to operate under and, and carve out this journey has regulations a lot. There's regulations, it seems like, every turn. And then we also have, how do we fund this? So we have a small request of you, and it doesn't seem small, but 700,000 in the context of the damage at Westcliff and the existing work that we want to do, it is small. So we also need to figure out in the long term how to fund all of this. And then um, be able to put together pathways and a prioritized plan that we know could get knocked asunder through natural erosion and these terrible weather events that we're continuing to experience. So anything that we put in front of you has the codicil that we're probably going to be back when something else happens. And it's, it's exhausting, but it's also something that we know that we have to deal with in, in this environment. So how does all of that, how do those constraints and the world and the context that we have to operate within, um, what are we doing? So we're taking all the thought input that is out there and that is some multi-decades of existing master plan work. And that comes out of many departments, be it Parks and Rec, Public Works, our climate action, program, we have a lot of great work and knowledge in our master plans to be able to leverage. So we combine that with our community group feedback and thoughts and our com individual community members with our staff subject matter expertise and the knowledge of our regulatory partners, partnering with other agencies and how they need to go about their work and what is important to them, as well as our legislators. So all of that information and those thoughts we put together and we develop prioritized needs and requirements that are updated given the damage in our existing world that we have to work in. And then we define the projects and we take those projects and we then have to prioritize and funnel them further. So we have a set of prioritized West Cliff projects that we go after and we put timelines and action plans associated with that. 
So that's the process. You're like, okay, Laura Schmidt, how long is that gonna take? Uh, this is just a view of the first six months. So right now we are in the data gathering phase that started in January shortly after the storm events and the surge, and that'll go through the middle of March. We have already started the community connections and the community outreach event. That first one was on February 13th. Our formal community connections with our pop-ups and our surveys will start in early March, especially should you um, give us direction on the one way. But this other process related to pathways and prioritize plan has to happen regardless of one way. So the community outreach here happens in addition to the one way community outreach that we do. So we're trying to spread our staff across both of these Gantt charts essentially. So on the community outreach events related to the roadmap and the planning piece of it, we are targeting to do that monthly and align them with key milestones, either draft input into a draft deliverable, review of a draft deliverable, and are just something critical that is coming up and we will try as much as possible to align those with a touch point with a more formal structured event monthly. That's the goal. Doing all of that, doing that work in February, we've already started it. We want to come out with some recovery pathways and options by the middle of May. Then in the middle of May, we transition to a prioritized plan and more detailed ways about what plan and prioritized projects are we going to, after, go, going to go after, the order that we're going to go after them in, and how we believe we can fund them. And that will take us through the end of August. And then the fun of the implementation of all of that begins. But we will continue to do all of the re repair and recovery work that has to happen, that, Nathan outlined earlier with those um, sites that were listed in the damage of the, what's the name, the flyover thingy? Never mind. Thank you, Ariel. <laughs> we're, very good, thank you. Um, so that will all happen and that will take us through the end of August. And then on the horizon, we have feedback on that prioritized plan. So that will be in the follow on Gantt chart of going back out to the community, say this is what we think we wanna do. And then a at probably somewhere around a 10 year planning horizon with a funding and a rollout. So that's kind of where we are right now. That's what your amazing Westcliff team has been looking at. So we are asking for council action today to receive this update to retroactively approve the traffic emergency protective measure that we put in place that Nathan outlined in that gray um, PowerPoint slide. We're asking you to direct us to do a one-way pilot and return in May with the design and plan. And we're asking you to fund out of our general fund stabilization reserves a seed project in fiscal year 2023 immediately for this Westcliff work. And we will use part of that seed funding of that $700,000 to release step six, which is an RFP for engineering and design services related to the one-way pilot to be able to help us go out, gather data, and work with our staff and a professional services consulting firm to be able to put forth to the community and back to you at the end of May a design and a plan to do the one-way pilot. And with that, I'll ask you what questions you have. Ms. Schmidt, Mr. Nguyen, thank you very much for an excellent presentation. Let me see if there are questions and comments from council members, Ms. Bruner. Thank you. Uh, my question is when you return in May for approval with uh, a design and plan, would that include a length of time for the pilot program? Yeah, yes, thanks, uh, Council Member Bruner. Yeah, I believe we would, we would propose a time frame at which we would want to institute that plan. And um, uh, my other question is, would that plan and community outreach also include, um, we received a lot of correspondence from the public with concerns on the other streets and how 
a one-way traffic flow would would affect those other streets around that area. And so that would all be include, included in the design and plan. That's correct. As, the, as we develop a plan for a one-way pilot, we would incorporate uh, data collection points on the side streets and uh, uh, most likely institute also traffic calming measures in conjunction with the one-way pilot. The, with the pilot itself, we want to be able to collect that data to actually determine the, the impacts on the neighboring streets so that we can make some informed decisions later as since, again, this is a pilot that we can make changes uh, further down the road. And, and I was remiss in highlighting the traffic calming measures. It is definitely present in the agenda report and we are looking at a one-way pilot holistically. It is not just from one point to another on West Cliff Drive. It is inclusive of the impact of that one way to the surrounding neighborhoods and the traffic calming to put in place to be able to alleviate the changes. Thank you. Council Member Brown. Thank you. Um, and thank you for the response to that question. I, I also wanted to ask about that. And, and so I'll just follow up and, um, and ask in terms of, because we are getting a lot of communications about this and some of them are very specific to particular blocks and some of it's just more general. Um, <clears throat> in terms of making sure that those data points get into your uh, calculus as you're figuring out the, the plan and traffic calming measures, you know, signage, other things, should we just be sending you those, uh, forwarding those messages to, I, I did forward one, I thought, oh, I, you got it, right? That I, um, I wasn't sure if you will get them as well, or, you know, which ones you get. So should we just keep sending you messages like that that are, can be helpful for uh, addressing concerns of the neighbors? Yeah, no, that's a great question, actually. And, and I apologize, we didn't uh, include it in this presentation, but we do have a new website that was developed in response oh, to the emergency protective measures that were installed. So cityofsantacruz.com slash Westcliff traffic controls. On that web page, we've designed it so that we've uh, put the latest information on the current events that have happened on Westcliff. And there's actually at the bottom of that page a, a, um, a, a way for you, the public, to provide input. And that can be collected in an organized manner. Great. So also promoting that and getting that out to constituents when they so this is the page that Nathan is talking about. The other thing that we are going to do and publish out the change to is we're going to create another option underneath here. So it's right now I have a question and I have a comment. We're going to add a box for traffic calming specifically so we could weed those out easily. So those um, requests will be able to be able to just parse them off so we can look at those specifically. Thank you. Council Member Colin Tari Johnson. Thank you for the presentation and the work you've done so far on this. Um, you know, it's not an easy task. So um, I'm glad you talked about some of the specific ways of community outreach. I, I know that some community members and neighbors that are impacted um, didn't know about this agenda item. Um, so I'm wondering if, so this is a question and comment and maybe direction, but. Um, can we do direct mail to the residents that live in the impacted streets, um, rather than uh, you know putting something out on the social media that is we're gonna we're gonna do this town hall or this community event? Can we have direct mail to make sure that the residents on the impacted streets are know about any of the events that will come up? I think the short answer to the question is yes. I think we can definitely um, add that as a part of the outreach that gets performed with, the, with regards to a potential one-way pilot. Um, we can look at the number of streets. It's, we, we send out mailers for, uh, quite often for, for um, projects, and so we can definitely incorporate okay. that. Okay. Do you need that as part of a direction, or is this conversation enough? Okay. I think this conversation okay. is enough. Yeah. Um, um, let's see. So Councilmember Brown asked, I think pretty much asked my question, that we have been getting a lot of specific suggestions on traffic calming um, strategies, and I'm definitely not a traffic engineer, so I don't know what's feasible, what's not, but some of these seem really great, you know, speed bumps on certain streets or forming of cul-de-sacs or putting a water barrier, putting up no thorough um, street signs. So as we get these, um, as we get these, I know we can direct folks yeah. to the website, but as we get this, what is the best mechanism for us to connect directly and um, make this part of our efforts? And do you need direction today with some of these specific suggestions? 
Uh, I don't know if we necessarily need a specific direction to take in public comment. We do that quite often with okay. a lot of the projects that we have. Um, I would, the traffic engineering team is most likely going to lead the effort as getting the um, uh, consultant on, onboarded. And so um, in addition to the website, we'll probably direct that type of comments to our traffic engineering team so they can collect that information. And then when we bring back a proposed project, we can have the, the comments included and then what's being proposed. And then, of course, we, we talk about the pluses and minuses of why we're proposing a particular design. And um, so some of these measures seem like they're more immediate asks um, and not to be not to wait until May. So what do we do in those circumstances? Um, currently, there's there's nothing uh, there's nothing to find yet as far as um, the, beyond the emergency protective measures that we've put in place in addition to the detour signing that's out there now. We've done some initial data collection, which Laura uh, had on her slide, where we're trying to collect the amount of traffic that we're seeing on these other uh, local streets. Mm -hmm. But what we're asking for is part of the one-way pilot is to expand upon that. Mm -hmm. We really do want to be able to make a more robust uh, data collection process so that we can really make these uh, propose uh, different designs with these informed um, with, with the data that we collect. And I would just add, as, as with any urgent request that a council member or the mayor may get from a community member, um, just funnel it to the department head. So if it is related to traffic and streets, I would say send that to Nathan and he can be the clearinghouse to determine if is it, is it feedback for a one way, is it feedback for something else in the public works area, is it urgent, that sort of thing. So I would, I would use um, Nathan as the clearinghouse. Sorry. Okay, um, so I, I may come back to this during the discussion because there are some specific directions that we've been asked to explore. Um, and then could you speak to any potential impacts on emergency response if we were to move forward with a pilot one way? So, um, you know, so, fire so, yeah. and police come, going out because someone has fallen off the cliff, so. So any, any design that Public Works puts together in conjunction with the community and the um, engineering consulting firm has to be able to accommodate the through traffic of public safety. So it has to be informed by that, and that, that is a baseline given for us. Great, okay, last question for now. Um, can you provide a little bit more specificity around the 700,000 and what that would be used for? Uh, sure, I'm happy to kind of elaborate more on the cost estimate that was developed. So as a part of the emergency protective measures that are in place now, uh, we're roughly estimating around 200, 250,000 just for the water barriers and the striping that was, in, that was installed in la uh, last January. So when we extrapolate that and we start looking at a little bit more uh, how long Westcliff is, where these limits might go, we, we roughly came up with a number of around 500 to 600,000 uh, for these additional uh, protective measures. So in addition to that, when we talk about professional consulting services, uh, looking at a contract that may end up being 12 to 24 months, and you're looking about the amount of time and effort for uh, the engineering consulting staff, and so we roughly estimated that at about one to 200,000. So that's how we came up with a roughly a $700,000 request. Thank you. Council Member Watkins. Thank, thank you, Mayor. Thank you for the presentation. My colleagues asked a lot of the questions that I had. Um, I think just building on the question around the funding, I see in the account we have 1.4 million in that specific reserve, and I'm wondering if you have, and maybe Matt, as the city manager at that level, if you have su sort of ideas, suggestions as you talk about the needs for our CIP budget to expand, I mean, that will go quick given some of the concerns and some of the issues that keep arising in our community, and so <laughs> are there other reserves, or are there, what should we be thinking about in terms of funding in addition to that? Uh, thanks for the question, um, uh, Vice Mayor Watkins, or excuse me, Council Member Watkins. And I'm sure Laura will have some thoughts on this as well, but um, this is absolutely initial seed money to get some of these uh, initial um, remediation projects in place. Uh, part of that consulting uh, funding will be going towards uh, bringing Farallon on board, who will be helping us with a number of the federal funding pathways that we're gonna be exploring so we can leverage those to the full extent and then as part of our, um, our CIP and capital prioritization work as we move into the fiscal year 24 budgeting, uh, Westcliff will absolutely be part of that conversation as well. 
I think for us to really move some of the larger scale projects we're talking about here as we take a more comprehensive uh, view of Westcliff as a recreational area, um, it's really gonna require a multi-jurisdictional, multi-agency effort, including uh, federal, state, and local funding streams. So we will be exploring all of those opportunities. Sorry, I think I misread it. So it's 1.4 in expenditure, and that's only 700,000 from the general fund, correct? Is that, that's what the budget adjustment request has. With the other amount coming from the, um, let's see, I'm just trying to understand the funding and what, and, and then also the amount that we have currently in this fee stabilization fund. Hi, so maybe I'll call Elizabeth, Elizabeth. Cable, uh, our finance director. Go for it, Elizabeth. Hi, Elizabeth Cable, finance director. Um, so right now we have in our stabilization reserve, we have a couple of different, um, we, we have a, about 7.3 million in what we refer to as our emergency reserve. And then we also have a pension stabilization that's part of that. So what we're asking is for 700,000 to come out of that emergency reserve piece and go over into the general fund. Um, and then, so, so that's the basic funding, to that, that's where it's going to come from. And then that will go into the CIP fund because that's where the, the actual expenditures are going to occur. Does that help clarify? And I think the other thing to keep in mind is um, the years of recovering the funds from the federal side of funding, um, we will recover some of the funds, not all of them. So the total expenditure is actually 700,000, although it says on the budget adjustment request, it's 1.4 million. I'm just trying to clear, I'm just trying to understand. And That's correct, and I don't know if Elizabeth is still on, but the way the, the form is set up is that the request is for still for 700,000. Um, uh, and I, I can see how the total expenditure shows 1.4 million there, but the request is only for 700. Um, okay. Be able to explain that. Elizabeth, she's Part looking at the actual attachment. Yeah, the actual VA itself um, that's attached to the staff report. Part of it is the way that we do the accounting for the project expenses. And so the total expenses, so um, we have the, the money coming, there's kind of, it's two, it's the same 700,000 that's coming out of the stabilization reserve and then going into the general fund. And then there's also a transfer um, from the actual expenditures are happening in the CIP fund. So you're seeing two expenses. You're seeing one expense for the transfer from the stabilization into the CIP, and then you're seeing another expense where they actually spend the money on the project. Okay. So that's why it looks like 1.4, but it's really 700. Okay, thank you for explaining that. I was confused by that, I, that form, I think. Um, I guess my other question is sort of around the data gathering, and my understanding is how I'm hearing it from you both is essentially there's gonna be two components. One, what you're learning right now, or have been learning over the past several months, in addition to what we already know in terms of former plans or existing plans that we have on the books. And I guess my question is in regards to, one, is that accurate? And I, th I think it is, but if you have anything more to add around sort of the data gathering, I'd love to hear it. And then the second part of the question is in regards to existing reports that we already have, are those still relevant? I think we had design reports or planning in um, kind of in a different time in terms of storms of the past and not necessarily the storms of the future. And I'm wondering if there is a sort of maybe an overlay or an opportunity for an overlay of some scientific additional data and information to help us think holistically about what to expect in years to come. Um, so I think on the tactical data gathering piece of it, Public Works has already um, put in place, I call them bump bumps, because when my car drives over the court, it goes bump bump. Nathan, what's the actual name of those? Just a traffic counter. So, <laughs> yes, they, they've looked at me in, in project meetings going, Laura, bump bump, really? But you know what they are, right? They're bump yeah. bumps, yes. Mm -hmm. Um, so they have already put some of those in place. Additionally, with the engineering design work that will happen, they will also do additional data gathering as far as traffic patterns and what is currently happening out there. And then we're also looking at um, other um, places like Waze and being able to get data from other sources that will help inform where people are going 
ways will only get us the um, vehicle piece of it, but other mechanisms need to be able to get us bike and ped information as well. So there's that tactical data gathering, there's the community events and the community ongoing collaborations and communications that we'll do. So there's those piece of it, pieces of it. And I think related to your question about our existing um, body of master plans and other work, some of it's relevant and some of it's not. And that's one of the things that we're working with Farrell on to wade through is to figure out which pieces are still informative and can help guide us on pathways and choices given what our current environment looks like and which ones aren't. So we need to go through that reconciliation process and uh, reconcile it and demystify it and then put it together. Additionally, we need to explore the state, federal, local funding mechanisms um, using other um, interagencies, cross-agency teams. That um, There's one that Farallon talked to, to us about from the Department of Water, where they have these strike teams that are cross-agency and thinking creatively, how do we use that for this case? And we're also, quite frankly, trailblazing in a lot of ways of putting together the, these long -term, this long-term project in response to these very um, damaging natural events. So it, it's a lot of fun, but a lot of data that needs to be put together. No, I appreciate that, and I think what I'm also um, maybe suggesting, or if there's an opportunity, is to think about how to overlay that with projections, right? I think we have our current situation, we've had our past situation, and then now we have an accelerated mm -hmm. climate situation, yep. and so how are we projecting the extreme circumstances versus what I think we had in terms of this longer kind of runway to make some of these changes happen given what we have coming? So, yeah, no, I appreciate the clarification. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Council Member Golder. Um, thank you guys very much. Um, as you can imagine, I've had a lot of um, community outreach living in the, the District 6 neighborhood now um, where all the affected parts of the road are. And so I have a, a few questions that came to me um, from the community. And one of them was um, around the storms from 82, 83 that some of us remember. And people are asking, um, because people have told me I was too young to remember the damage extent, but I was told the damage was worse to Westcliff. And people are asking me, how much did that cost at the time, just for scale? And um, knowing that it took a couple years to repair, but it lasted 40 years at least, if, if so, I'm just wondering. Um, I do if not anybody know knows. the answer to that question, but we can come back to okay. uh, find that okay. answer. Okay. Yeah, I know it's kind of specific. Another one um, actually came to me from a high school student um, that we met yesterday. And this one was, um, they saw your presentation and they appreciated that the city was ready to pull the trigger on the repairs for two of those spots and were disappointed the repairs hadn't happened in time and asked, are there other critical infrastructure currently at risk in the city because of deferred maintenance that we should be worrying about? Are there other spots on West Cliff or other? I know it's kind of a little off topic, but, huh? We need a study session. I know. <laughs> Maybe a study session. I mean. So the, the short answer to that is yes. Every city and every county in our country has deferred infrastructure and maintenance that has gone by the wayside. One of the major projects that Elizabeth is leading as the finance director is a long-range financial plan. And part of that long-range financial plan is not just the sustainability of our operations, but it is how do we fund our ongoing capital investment program. We have, I think at my last memory, over $300 million in our CIP list and we have been funding one to $5 million per year. So we, we need a structural shift in the way that we fund capital investment and how to do that in the long run for the city. But it's a, it's a similar situation. We are not alone in this. Every city in the country has this issue. And, yes. and, oh, go ahead. and public works, parks and rec, 
every department prioritizes and and really goes after every budget year the the major issues and we are doing our best to address those um, and try to get them fixed before um, something happens and so I think to that to that um, since it appears that Westcliff is one of the most beloved treasures that um, many people in the community hold to their heart. They walk, run, ride bikes, surf, what drive, whatever. Um, have we given thought on ways that we can help fund long-term maintenance and um, without dipping into the general fund and looking at alternative revenue sources? Mr. Huffaker. <laughs> well, this is the fun part that Laura was talking about. But um, yeah, there are a number of pathways that we are already starting to explore. Things like infrastructure financing districts, parking benefit districts, obviously the federal and state funding that's already been referenced. And so I, I think there are gonna be a number of opportunities we explore from a sustainable funding standpoint that I think the community will be excited about because it'll mean that we'll be able to make some investments along West Cliff that we have frankly struggled to deal uh, based on limited resources. So that'll be part of the conversation, part of this multi-department effort so that we have other folks, including Bonnie Lipscomb and her team with economic development that have done quite a bit of this work in other ways of really prioritizing Westcliff as we move through these opportunities and identify other funding sources that are not um, an a, a potentially a additional demand on the general fund. Thank you. And I think everybody can appreciate, you know, the collaboration between all of the uh, departments and definitely the community too, right? Like there's people coming together who might have completely different opinions about which way Westcliff ultimately ends up. Um, but... I'm just wondering, in terms of community outreach, how are you going to balance the voices of the, the neighbors who use Westcliff as an arterial street to get to and from wherever they're going, <clears throat> and uh, the people that live on the neighborhood streets in there, and then the people that maybe come just to enjoy it for the day, or people that you know come from outside the county, or visitors from all over the globe? How are we going to balance everybody's... Um, input in developing, you know, future plans? Yeah, that's a great question. I appreciate that. I, I think the uh, part of the process is going to be keeping everyone informed and up to date about where we're at, the decision points that were that are coming up, uh, the data that's been collecting, presenting it back to you all, the community, so that we can, again, collectively make these decisions together. Uh, when we talk about, when I said mentioned earlier that a proposed plan would come out, it, it's just that a proposal at that point based on data that we've gathered. It's really similar to a lot of the challenging projects that we have citywide where there's competing interests, but we want to be able to get make sure that we're collecting everyone's um, comments and then providing that back to you all so you can see the feedback and then being uh, providing a recommendation on, on how to move forward. And I think... Thank, well, go ahead. One of the things historically that, uh, that we've struggled with in, in this space is making those hard choices. So one of the challenges for the team and for the community and for the council too is we are going to have to make some hard choices, but given what happened with the atmospheric rivers, we do have to make choices. So it is sometimes going to come down to making a difficult choice and going down that route and, and pivoting and doing something. And we will not be able to keep everybody happy. Well said, and I have to say, like ultimately if we do nothing, we'll have nothing. It will literally disintegrate into the ocean, so we have to make some decisions. Thank you. Council Member Watkins. Yeah, thank you for those questions. I just, I just remembered I had a couple of, uh, of follow-ups. In regards to the community information sharing, are you open to other um, opportunities and suggestions, or are those set at this point? The one that comes to mind was Absolutely. visit Santa Cruz County. Potentially, if you wanted to attend that board meeting, I think it's a huge part of our community and our tourism, and I think they'd really benefit from that. And then the other question I had is in regards to the series of competitions and events that are held on Westcliff. I don't know if you've consulted with some of the organizing folks with those or how that's also factored into some of the planning, knowing that that is a very um, 
highly utilized stretch of our community for events and competitions and runs and such like that. It, it, it's definitely a consideration and Parks and Rec, Parks and Rec as a department is heavily involved with the integrated team. And if, if any council member has additional um, information sharing opportunities, feel free to email Erica Smart. She is our communications manager extraordinaire. Further questions or comments from council members? This would be the opportunity for the public to provide us with your input and it is very likely, am I correct, Ms. Bush, we have some folks online as well. What we we're do. going to do is we will take people, we will alternate between someone here in our chambers and then someone uh, who is online. Let me note for you that prior to today's meeting, we received question, or excuse me, requests from Save Westcliff to have extra time for their presentation. That has been granted West, uh, Save Westcliff will be permitted up to 10 minutes, and Mr. Bob Goldbeck also made a request for extended time, so instead of the normal three minutes, Mr. Goldbeck will receive five minutes. Good afternoon. My thinking, my thinking cap. There we go. <laughs> Nicholas Whitehead. So, we don't want any heavy vehicles on this temporary road. They, they could really present a danger. You don't want heavy vehicles going through the neighborhood, so there's a bit of a conundrum there. Um, how about a toll road? A dollar a shot for everybody driving on there to pay for some of the cars. But they can pay at the end of the drive. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> but seriously, I think there are, I can think of three three departments of the state of California that have a vested interest in having this road done properly. Um, the, the Tourism and Visitor Promotion Department of State, the Commerce Department of State, because our local economy depends on this. Um, there may be others, but those ones do stand out. Um, I think, honestly, the the uh, federal army engineers, or the, or the, or the state's um, equivalent, the National Guard engineers, they ought to be doing this. Uh, they ought to be handling this construction. If we have to carry the burden with private engineers, and uh, that's going to be very costly. So I think that, that should be an option that should be uh, considered. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Whitehead. We're going to take one of the folks who is online, then we'll take another person who's here in chambers with us this afternoon, Ms. Bush. Hello, am I on? Thank you. Yes, good afternoon. Okay, yes, my name's, uh, thank you for this opportunity to speak. My name is Bob Goldbeck. And my wife Jennifer and I uh, live at the corner of Oxford and Woodrow, so we're kind of speaking for the neighbors here. Uh, and we're, that puts us one block up from the West Cliff Drive closure at the Bethany Curve Bridge. So we're kind of near ground zero or at ground zero. So I'm here to speak about then, so the nitty gritties of the negative impacts of the closure on the traffic to the neighborhood here and the need for additional. Uh, uh, traffic calming measures and particularly particular or particular a lot of us neighbors are asking for a cul-de-sac arrangement on oxford way uh, and the other side streets perhaps alta and plateau because after the january storm of course and the closure at westcliff drive the drivers just spontaneously had to find their own detours and they just took the closest side streets initially that was uh up to Pelton, and then to, and then they took Oxford. Now they can come down Westcliff to Wedrow and come up, but they still take Oxford, the same uh, the same kind of default detour that started originally, and that's still what's going on. So uh, when uh, Nathan Newen's great uh, presentation did mention that they 
said he came up with a detour plan that now is supposed to send people up Woodrow to Delaware, these are big arterial streets, and then down Almar around the closure. Uh, that's a great plan. Those are arterials designed to handle a lot more traffic than these little side streets. And the intersections are set up for people to, to get past each other uh, with that kind of volume of traffic. The problem is uh, there's signs up, but people that just aren't paying attention uh, for whatever reason. So even though there is signage for this new detour plan, it's not what's happening on the ground. Uh, people are still in large measure taking the shortcut through Oxford Way, which is of course a small side street. It was never meant to handle this kind of volume of traffic, and particularly its intersection with Woodrow, uh, a small side street arterial intersection. Uh, drivers basically, uh, when there's congestion in the morning or in the afternoon commute or at sunset, draws a huge stream of traffic to Westcliff. They are all uh, trying to cram through a little intersection, turning left in front of each other. Traffic comes to a standstill. As uh, drivers run the stop signs in their confusion and in their hurry, it's a pretty dangerous situation. We, Sitting right here, we hear the honking, <laughs> hear the, uh, with the yeah. brakes hold, no, hold, hold on just a second, Mr. Sorry. Colbeck. We, we are going to now add the rest of your time. There we go. Okay. Please proceed to pace. So much. Thank you. So the point is, it's a big mess. Uh, it's not safe for motorists, bicyclists, or pedestrians. And what we're suggesting then is that the city uh, institute calming measures that require that use physical barriers. My point being that the drivers are not paying attention to signage. Uh, there's even a road close sign at the detour for eastbound drivers at Almar. As they come down Westcliff to Almar, they're told to turn left. While I sat there for about uh, 11 minutes the other day, with the, took videos, most of the drivers swerve around that road close sign, decide that they are local traffic, I guess, uh, which, by the way, sends them in the pathway of people shortcutting the other way, westbound on Oxford. And then they continue on to Oxford Way. So they're not paying attention to the signs telling them to go up Woodrow to Delaware, and they're not really paying attention to the signs telling them to go up Almar to Delaware. So most east and westbound traffic are ignoring the signs. So we are asking for cul-de-sacs then, mainly at Oxford Way, which bears the greatest burden, but I understand that Alta and Plateau are also seeing short cutters to their street. There is a crosswalk for the Bethany Curve Green Belt pathway that crosses all those streets. That would be the natural place, I think, to put barriers to create cul-de-sacs. This would preserve access for residents to their homes and coastal access to the David Way area, which I think the coastal condition is concerned about, but it would uh, stop the shortcutting. So that's what we're asking for here. And urgently, please, we don't want to wait till May. Thank you. Mr. Goldbeck, thank you for your thoughtful testimony. We appreciate that. Thank you. Mr. Ramadan, good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon, uh, Mayor Keeley and council members. Thank you for the opportunity to address the council on this important topic, the future of Westcliff. Our group, Save Westcliff, was founded six weeks ago and has grown quickly to 514 members. We have prepared two documents for your consideration today. Uh, you should have received them via email on Sunday. And I'm just going to hold them up so that you can visualize this. I'm sure you've got lots of other documents in the last 24 or 48 hours, but there's Sir, two. We did, we did receive those. Those were distributed to all council members. We had those in the package. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much. And um, for, those of you, for those of you in attendance today or those participating virtually, you can actually download these documents at savewestcliff.com. And if you click on the blog section, you'll be able to access them. 
Uh, the first document is a presentation called Save Westcliff Briefing, which outlines who we are, our mission, and our approach. The second document is a letter commenting specifically on item 23 today. <coughs> Firstly, we would like to touch on highlights from the briefing presentation. As you've heard, the damage caused by the storm on January 5 had an impact on our collective psyche. The video of the storms ravaging Westcliff are posted on our website. You can hear the raw emotion from people watching waves breaking over their road and over cars in parking lots. In the aftermath of the storm, Save Westcliff was founded. And it tapped into something our community was feeling. That is, Westcliff is more than a road with pipes under it. It is a living ecosystem with a very rich history. Our Westcliff recreational area is about parklands, surf breaks, bike paths, walking trails, access points, a scenic drive, beaches, kelp beds, seals, sea otters, endangered species, and the sheer joy of a vantage point across one of the world's wonders, Monterey Bay. And yes, like Yosemite, it has a road through it. We launched our Save Westcliff campaign on January 17. In the weeks that followed, thousands of people have viewed our website and more than 500, as I mentioned, have joined our mission. Local press became, began covering our movement, which led to statewide news coverage and a New York Times article. This national attention raises the stakes for all. Whether we like it or not, Santa Cruz will be an example of how a community and its city responds. We can either run from it or embrace this opportunity. It's our choice. And as Hillary Bryant reminds us, if we do nothing, we will have nothing. We believe we need a new, more holistic approach. A we the community mindset, an inclusive circle driven by structured processes to explore and find solutions. We're encouraged to see the early signs of this approach with the inclusion of the Westcliff recovery pathways and roadmap processes outlined in today's agenda documents and outlined by the city staff earlier. We can draw strength and inspiration from other communities such as New the High Line in New York, LA River, Land's End in San Francisco. Each of these projects started with a foundation of deeply understanding community needs and then reimagined parklands to meet those needs. We hope this Westcliff recovery pathways and roadmap process follows a similar path and builds a strong community foundation and also moves us from the short-term focus of, quote, protecting the road to a longer-term view of protecting the recreation area as a whole. As COVID showed us, and as Sarah Gerhardt describes in her video on SaveWestcliff.com, we need these transformative places in our lives. Westcliff is where we come to, to clear our heads, seek healing with mental health challenges, find peace or inspiration, enjoy dozens of activities, such as walking, surfing, biking, swimming, and share experiences and stories with our friends and family. Westcliff is a very special place. We need to save her, and we need to restore her. We ask everyone to join this mission and to start by considering what our children and grandchildren are going to need in 50 years. And then we can work back from there. Now we would like to invite Sean Burns, who's the coordinator of the Santa Cruz World Surfing Reserve, to read our letter to council. Thank you. Good afternoon. 
Orlando, Mayor Keeley, and the Santa Cruz City Council members. This letter is to commend the city's work in response to the damage caused by the storms in January, and to please vote to support the six proposed recommendations to continue this effort. It is clear that even simply addressing the immediate repairs will far exceed what our general fund can manage. We commend city staff for using this moment to push for maximum funding through FEMA and FHWA programs and all other sources. We continue to encourage the council and community to think long-term. Sea level rise is accelerating and we must think beyond the band-aids and immediate repairs. Our hope is that the West Cliff Recovery Pathways and Roadmap is a strategic overarching look at the entire resource, which considers transportation, the neighborhood impacts, and access to recreation, while also recognizing that West Cliff is our most iconic park. We are grateful that the proposal also focuses on enhancing the participation of the community in the process. This is an essential consideration if we're to find solutions on our coast that work for all. We must protect this vital piece of coastline for future generations. This requires action. Without action, we will continue to watch Westcliff disappear. We look forward to collaborating with the city on this critical effort to preserve this treasured coastline. If you'd like to read this letter or learn more, please go to savewestcliff.com. Mayor Keeley and council members, thank you for allowing us to share our mission to save Westcliff. We look forward to working with you, city staff, nonprofits and community members to achieve this goal. Thank you. Well, thank you very much and thanks to Save Westcliff for your organizing and caring so deeply about this important, not only roadway, but destination in our community. Thank you very much for that. Let me see, Ms. Bush, do we have someone else online? Good, let's go to them now. Yes, hello, this is Garrett. Hey, reading over all the letters sent in, it's fairly obvious 95% of the people are oblivious to how hugely consequential a premature dispassionate decision of managed retreat really is. I suspect they are distracted from it by an easy out carrot of removing a car lane and a selfish desire for more play space. I personally don't care if all of West Cliff becomes that one way play space, as long as Oxford Fair and Plateau has barrier dead ends at Bethany Creek if they are needed. One way will make traffic worse, period, and less safe. The study is an expensive, perfunctory one since the one-way decision uh, really seems already decided, complete with a fixed solar baseline study, and I'd rather see that money go to actual West Cliff stabilization efforts as a first priority instead. Make no mistake, managed retreat is the most radical, no choice, last resort, drastic cliff erosion adaptive strategy ever. Cut and run is only rational when it was no longer safe or beneficial to use any other adaptive strategy like seawall armoring, but because the city doesn't have the cachet because of its endless profligate spending habits, missed priorities, running accounts down to zero while demanding sacrifice like blowing money, prioritizing theoretical climate change stuff to no real benefit or analysis of the risks while doing little to nothing to proactively prevent known immediate threats here we are now, la di da with playtime priority misdirection. The question that needs an honest answer is, do you want to cheapskate surrender other citizens' homes to the sea any faster than will eventually occur a la Pacifica by under-prioritizing CIP optimal fixes of any minor loss of roadway and instead appeasing sightseers, creating more traffic congestion? Everybody knows the hydrodynamics of wave reflection intensification have always produced huge waves and water spouts at the locations that failed. The armoring there was relatively minor compared to the seawalls that have been built to protect the apparently higher priority parking lots. I would mention, managed retreat is highly unpopular once houses start falling into the sea and Pacific citizens uh, recalled, dumped the entire city council and purged all references to managed retreat uh, for a cliff erosion uh, strategy from the city muni code. And the city was held responsible for all the demolition costs, which amounted to half their budget in the past. The city needs to fix that road and do a lot better engineering next time. A fortuitously reimbursable opportunity to do this probably exists. Let's not be stupid. 
keep all that disaster money, even if you have to borrow some temporarily to better protect delaying the thermonuclear politics of managed retreat. The approach given as to one-time triggers justifying this radical plan coastal surrender action is not so simple a calculation than some rah-rah manufacturing crisis unelected bureaucrat entering a number into a spreadsheet. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Phillip. Anyone else with us in chambers who wishes to provide oral comment on this item? Ms. Bush, do we have anyone else with us? We do. We'll go to that person then. Hi, City Council. Thank you so much for having me. Um, my name is Nairi. I'm a resident um, in the Circles by Westcliff. Good afternoon. Thank you. I support a one-way Westcliff. Um, these storms have definitely presented a pivotal moment for the future of our streets. We can't keep the status quo where cars take up the most space and present a real danger to people recreating. Um, this is our opportunity to really transform Westcliff into a vibrant people-first space where everyone can enjoy walking, biking, and rolling in different forms. Um, I mean, you know, I'm hearing a lot about uh, the traffic and what do we do about the cars and these hard decisions, but really the question should, shouldn't be why, what should we do about all these cars and the people who want to drive Westcliff, it should be how can we encourage people to be less dependent on cars and visit this space via public transit by biking, walking, et cetera. And for those that are driving and do need to drive um, and taking alternative routes along Westcliff, what are some solid physical traffic calming measures to prioritize the safety of neighbors along Westcliff as well? Um, thank you so much for letting me speak and um, that's my comment, thank you. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, Mr. Myberg. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Certainly. Council people for having this hearing. Um, I'd like to just read a letter that which was a response by me to other neighborhood people and then elaborate a little on it, if you don't mind. I hope I stay within my time. Uh, my position is clear regarding Westcliff becoming one way. I am happy with the existing configuration but the winds of changes shift. If for climate adaption or any other reason, the larger community promotes a one-way on Westcliff, I want to instill in the planning design the need to retain two-way traffic on Westcliff between the Dream Inn and Lighthouse Point. A roundabout at this point will allow traffic to return and greatly lower the volume of auto traffic proceeding and needing to sift through the neighborhood. Two-way traffic for this stretch will allow flow from the Opperdon proposed project and the church to proceed back towards their de destination. Otherwise, the flow onto Pelton into the neighborhood and the inevitable uh, will be inevitable, and our ongoing need to protect butterfly habitat and other habitat will be undermined. So the reason I'm going ahead of the community process is I think Parks Commission, uh, California Parks Commission, needs to be brought into the discussion because if we were to do a roundabout, very attractive, somewhere near Lighthouse Point or its beach, uh, it'll deal with a conflict that uh, you've introduced, actually, because when we did the Opperdon project, which is gonna have immense effect in traffic and also church traffic I'm gonna introduce into this, um, we specifically, the Planning Commission um, conditioned a no right turn out of the parking lot onto Pelton, and the City Council heard the appeal and they endorsed that. Uh, now, to turn one way, to turn Lighthouse into one way, um, and it's a contradiction because the entire motivation of that was to redire redirect traffic back onto Westcliff. In addition to what I've just said is the, uh, uh, Nicholas came up with this at the beginning of his presentation, the amount of trucks involved in this huge project uh, need to go somewhere. And if we make uh, Westcliff one way, we are definitely promoting a huge impact into the neighborhoods. And this runs contrary to the decision by the Planning Commission as well as the City Council. So. Uh, once again, I'm, I'm suggesting that we reach out to uh, California state parks and see if we can take a little bit of land to create a roundabout and that this be a consideration 
if it was one way past that point, um, that would be a good trial. The last thing is pilot or trial, it's a lot harder to pull back from that than to put it into place. Uh, you create a constituency that will support whatever the pilot project introduces. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Bonnie, uh, excuse me, Ms. Bush, can we go to another person online? Thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, once more. Yes, thank you. Hi, you good afternoon. Hi, thank you. Um, City Council, Mayor, Vice Mayor, thank you for hearing me out. I live in the affected area of the corner of Oxford and David Way. And I appreciate all the work that's being done and consideration and outreach. Uh, I just want to speak to the experience that's um, taking place in my neighborhood. Um, and in my opinion, there should be um, priorities of what's happened immediately, which in my experience is that there's been a great deal of um, increased risk and danger in the area where uh, traffic is being diverted down Oxford and David um, versus long-term plans like the one way and uh, large um, traffic changes that the whole community has to weigh in on and um, is gonna take quite a while to implement and to consider. Um, in our neighborhood, uh, there has been the attempt to divert traffic up to Delaware from Woodrow and down to Almar, but as one of my neighbors already spoke to, that has been largely ineffective and we're having a pretty horrible experience ever since the closure with uh, the noise, the car parades, the stop sign running. Um, a lot of people seem to speed up once they get away, away from the beautiful scenery of Westcliff and basically try to race back to their chosen path. Um, so our neighborhood is suffering and I'd just like to ask for a faster path towards some traffic calming measures to try to actually enforce the intended uh, pathway that we're trying to send traffic because as of right now it's it's not working and it's unsafe for kids it's unsafe for walkers it's unsafe for bicyclists it's just become a very uh, dangerous situation so that's my experience and I hope you'll take that into consideration as this moves forward thank you thank you very much for calling in we appreciate your participation anyone else with us in chambers this afternoon. Oh, someone familiar with our chambers, for sure. I may not Good have afternoon. been here for the last eight years. Good um, afternoon, Ms. <laughs> Robinson. Thank you. I appreciate this conversation that I'm learning about. I had no knowledge of this agenda item um, till late on the weekend. And I'm not one that wants to go around and ask my neighbors, do they know about it? Do you know about this? potential of a one-way pilot. Um, there's a lot I've got on my plate and I want other people to be able to find out, but I remember a colleague on our council that always reminded us, notice who's not in the room. Notice who's not making comments in letters to the council. Um, I felt that that same experience existed when you were going through the process of the, um, actually the adaptation plan that needed to happen that's before the Coastal Commission now, and I had to insert myself in that to ask how you're getting that neighborhood input. I've done a deep dive with the letters that have just come in, they just arrived, and I've looked at the extra ones, and um, there's just misinformation happening because I even read in those that people are saying, go ahead with this, this pilot program, you've already, the council's already voted on it. These are just inaccurate statements, and then I'm looking at the staff report, which I'm used to having really thorough information in there when you're asking, when the council's being asked to do uh, these recommendations. That I do know I've been at a couple meetings where um, staff has already stated what the pilot program looks like and where it states from this point to this point. 
terms of streets on West Cliff, but it's not in here. I t completely appreciate and support what's happening for the neighborhoods most affected by the emergency that's taken place and the incredible work that staff has done in the emergency setting and the recommendations that council needs to do for that. That pilot program, in, a, in essence, is the one way. And I, I hope that that's the direction that the council takes because that needs to, you could see the impacts that they're already having and they're describing them to you and we're listening to them. And that's just a very short segment. Um, I feel like other considerations right now are um, jumping ahead. And I don't think that the council, I don't know, I'm, I'm concerned about that because I, I made a couple phone calls on my own block that will be incredibly impacted and they have no knowledge of today's conversation, no knowledge of the consideration of a pilot program. I know there's supposed to be future robust conversations, but this feels like this train's already on the track and most everyone is unaware and they're back at the train station not knowing there's a train that's already left. So I just need to make that comment because it has me disconcerned uh, to a degree that I wouldn't normally say that, but I'm trusting that we've got the right people in the room to do the right things. So I appreciate your time. Thank you, Mayor. Appreciate your participation. Ms. Bush. Thank you, Ms. Bush. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Am I on now? Yes, you are. Thank you for joining us. You're, you're on. I hate this system. Um, I live two and a half blocks from West Cliff. It's been my pleasure to live here for over 20 years. And, of course, I love it. Um, I certainly appreciate a lot of things that have been said, but I'm a little alarmed that some of the people who were talking have clearly not walked or biked along there. Um, the city had to do something, had to set up a temporary one-way system if they didn't want things crashing directly into the ocean. So some of the people just don't seem to realize that. Um, the signage is not entirely clear. A simple sign that says detour that way is not very instructive. It wouldn't be that difficult before the summer season gets going to have signs that say detour due to Westlift damage <coughs> via Delaware or something like that. Something along those lines that would make it a little clearer. Certainly I feel for the people in the Oxford neighborhoods and they think any kind of temporary um, traffic calming would be great. But here's what I want to say. It's really nice walking along West Cliff with less traffic. It's wonderful. That path that was six foot wide was horrible. It was really hard with bikes and dogs and kids and everything. And a much wider path will be a real asset to the community. Um, thank you for your hard work on this very thorny process. Thank you. Thank you very much. Anyone else with us in chambers this afternoon who would like to make comment on this item? This would be your opportunity. John, good afternoon. Nice to see you, sir. Been a minute. Not in Sacramento, which is nice. But anyway, I just want to make a quick comment about um, some of the, the uh, notices that we got in our neighborhood. I live on Monterey Street, just halfway down the block towards West Cliff, down the stairs to go to Cowles. Our neighborhood is heavily impacted every time there's surf or there's good beach. So, I mean, that's fine. I think everybody should have access to the beaches. And uh, part of what we got early in this process was a traffic design plan that rerouted all of West Cliff up Monterey Street. That was rather uh, upsetting to us, to say the least. 20,000 cars a day coming up a, a small residential street. We were told by staff that that was not supposed to be in the plan and don't worry about it. But once you see it in a plan, you have to worry about it. So uh, I think that the traffic concerns here are going to be the real difference between making this a success or not. Because 
I, I don't know the exact number. I think it's close to 20,000 cars a day. That's a lot of cars. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Ms. Bush. We have three more. Three more. All right. Good afternoon. Online, you are now ready to go. Good afternoon. And uh, thank you very much for allowing me to speak. My name is Glenn Seiler. I am uh, a resident on Pelton and Clark. So I'm also, I'm directly on the detour path. And uh, as one of my uh, neighbors said earlier, I'm on ground zero. Um, I, I'll keep it short. I, I just want to emphasize a sense of urgency. The, my takeaway from the earlier presentation was that there is not any more planned traffic calming measures until the pilot proposal in May. And as my neighbors on Oxford have, have also uh, you know, mentioned, uh, the area around Clark, we are under siege and we need immediate traffic calming measures. We cannot wait for a proposal in May. But I just wanna emphasize that there's a real sense of urgency here, and I, I would appreciate, uh, you know, some attention to that. I know I know that it's a, a complicated situation, but um, the the residents here really are under siege with all the traffic, and we need more than just a few detour signs. We we do need armor, and uh, cul-de-sacs and barriers. That's that's really all. I just wanted to reemphasize that. Well, thank you very much for participating. Thank you for your contribution in that regard. Let me see one more time and check to see if there's anybody with us in chambers. Ms. Bush, the next person online. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good, af Good afternoon. My name is Nancy, and I live on Woodrow Avenue at Oxford Way. I'm asking that priority be given to mitigating the impact of traffic on the neighborhoods adjacent to Westcliff sooner rather than later. In addition to determining how to proceed with Westcliff Drive, we also have an obligation to maintain the integrity, safety, and quality of life for the residents in adjacent neighborhoods who are now dealing with the impact of increased traffic volume, vehicle noise, loud radios, repeated traffic violations such as running stop signs and speeding, and in the last two, uh, let's see, seven weeks, we've had two accidents at the corner uh, or the intersection of Woodrow and Oxford Way. The city's Westcliff Drive Management and Adaptation Plan shows that on average, there are thousands of vehicle trips made on Westcliff Drive each day. Despite the detour signs, the last two months have proven that a large majority of these vehicles are now moving to smaller side streets, including Oxford Way, Alta, Plateau, and Clark. And this is in complete disregard of the city's detour plan and sign. Those residing, excuse me, those residing on Oxford Way and other adjacent streets have seen clearly that signage is not working and that something more is required. Most drivers who are going both westbound and eastbound Westcliff regularly ignore all the detour and road closure signs. The only thing that appears to be tour vehicles are actual physical barriers, such as the large orange water barriers that are closing West Cliff at the Bethany Green Belt. Oxford Way neighbors requested a meeting with city staff in late January to talk about the issues that we were experiencing and why the detour plan was not working. And I wanna say thank you to the staff. It was a really good meeting and we appreciated the staff's partic participation. However, I do want to point out that following the meeting, the staff walked with a small group of neighbors down Oxford Way from David Way to Woodrow Avenue. And during that short period of time, we were able to observe examples of every one of the issues that had been raised during the meeting. Um, I asked that the city council make moving detour traffic off of the smaller residential streets onto the larger arterial roadways, including Woodrow Avenue, Almar and Delaware Avenue as a priority for the, and I thank you for your consideration in this matter. Thank you very much. One more time back out here to the folks who are with us this afternoon. Ms. Bush, back over to our callers online. Thank you. Good afternoon.
person on the line. Good afternoon. Hi. Can you hear me? Oh, all good. You're, we can hear you now. Great. Wonderful. My name is Kim Dean, and I live on the corner of Oxford Way and David Way, and I like to share a segment of a letter that I sent to City Council yesterday. Um, I live here uh, for the last few years with my husband and elementary school age children. And I'm writing in regards to the um, significant residential impacts caused by the closure on Westcliff. Um, I've witnessed as well as video evidence from my security cameras, the exponential increase in vehicle traffic on David Way. The increased traffic comes with more noise pollution, speeding and other traffic violations namely ignoring the stop sign at the intersection of David Way and Oxford Way. Just scanning my security camera footage from this morning, nearly 90% of the cars driving at the intersection do not come to a complete stop. This has always been a problem at that intersection, but when multiplied by the increased number of vehicles, it has greatly increased risk of accidents and eroded the safety of this small residential street. My kids can no longer ride their bikes in front of the home and are unable to play with balls in case they run into the street and this has caused an impact on our family itself. The signage directing drivers to take detours from West Cliff down Almar and Delaware are mostly ignored despite the signs and our small street is severely impacted by the increased traffic. We want to have a safe and peaceful living environment for our family and pushing much of the traffic of West Cliff onto our small street is not sustainable nor conducive with raising a family. As I've been sitting here listening to this meeting itself and looking out my window, I've witnessed several people running the stop sign at the corner of David and Oxford. I don't know if it's possible to put up some type of um, traffic video camera because I believe that we could probably generate much of the um, capturing of that type of traffic on video camera, um, if that would be helpful, but I just don't know any way to make this corner safer for not just the residents, but even people who are um, driving by to visit Westcliff. I had a neighbor um, yell at a driver the other day because they almost ran over their dog as they were driving down Oxford. And so um, it, the, the issues with the street safety is really my biggest concern. And I hope the city council can help with this. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. I believe, Ms. Bush, we still have one, is that right? Okay, let me make sure, Mr. Stoner, it looks like you wandered in a little bit. Come on, plenty of time. You're, <laughs> you're in a timely fashion, come on in. Love to hear your comments. I have sir. more than three minutes, but I'm gonna keep it short. I'm um, sure you do. Thank you for your time, Council thank Member you, Mayor. Um, I'm just gonna backtrack here, because I had a lot more to, to talk about, but. Um, in 1997 and 1998, I was appointed by the mayor and city council to the Westcliff Drive Task Force. I don't know how many of you have read, the, read a report. Um, and we were tasked with solving some problems on Westcliff. Five public citizens, I was one of them, three park commissioners, three parks and rec, okay? I'm a little out of breath because I had to park away and run over here. Anyway, um, we took surveys, different times of the day, different days of the week, different months of the year, started in 97, finished in 98. The predominant use of Westcliff was 90% automobile. We had 24 other types of uses of the, at that time it was a designated bikeway, and we decided to make the path a multi-use path. Um, we, there was all kinds of uses. We had horseback riders, anything under 10 we didn't document. Um, but the predominant use was automobiles, but there was a group that was pushing the one way. Now, I like this plan with the West Cliff, but I don't like the one way aspect of it, especially from Bay to um, Columbia. There's no erosion along that section. So why do you want to waste the money and close that, make it one way? I thought it had to do with the one way where the erosion actually happened. And to roll back the clock in 82, 83, the El Nino winter, I was here. Three times as much damage on Westcliff as we have now. And I've, I've tried to listen to some of your presentation, but I figured I better come down here because the TV froze, okay? 
Uh, thank you for your time. Appreciate it. Jim, thank you for all of your good work in the community over the years. Very much appreciated. Ms. Bush, one more. Is that it? Good. We have one more person online. Good afternoon. They've also been trying to unmute them, but they haven't. Um... I see. Okay. Oh, okay. okay. So remember to unmute yourself here. And we are ready for your testimony. <coughs> Good afternoon. Okay, I'm going to give you about five more seconds, not trying to rush you, but uh, three seconds, two seconds. We can all run a four-minute mile the way I count. <laughs> And one second, and we are finished. All right. I apologize to you uh, for uh, whatever happened there. Anyone else in chambers wish to provide testimony? Seeing and hearing none, the matter is back before the council. The mayor will recognize a council member for a motion. Vice Mayor Golder. Um, thank you. So having met with many people in the community I'm and gonna, oh. I'm going to be strict about okay, this. Okay, I'd like to make a motion. There we go. Thank you. I don't want to be that person. I don't want to be that guy. There we okay. go. I sent my motion to Bonnie. Um, and, and I'd like to I'll start reading it. I'd like to make a motion to receive and update citywide work citywide West Cliff work and retroactively approve the design and installation of traffic striping and signage for emergency protective measures on West Cliff Drive due to the January 23 storm damage and direct staff to coordinate work, including community outreach, to determine a pilot one-way traffic control options and neighborhood calming in and around West Cliff storm damage area between Columbia Street and Almar Avenue during repairs. Return to council in May, and I would, I kind of, can I, I kind of want to change it from May to earlier, but I'll, okay. We'll do that under yeah. amendments. All right, we'll do. For approval to pilot West Cliff Drive with one-way automobile traffic options, two-way bicycle and pedestrian ac access, neighborhood traffic, traffic calming measures, and monitoring plan in and around Columbia Street, Almar Avenue, and Delaware Avenue, and adopt the resolution amending the um, 23 budget to appropriate 700000 in the general fund stabilization reserve to a Westcliff resiliency and accessibility project and the authorization to advertise and award professional services to design Westcliff Drive pilot project with neighborhood calming in and around Columbia Street, Almar Avenue, and Delaware Avenue. The city manager is hereby authorized to direct and execute contract, the contracts in a form approved by the city attorney, the public works director, and wait, Public Works Director is authorized to ex execute change orders within the approved budget. Is there a second? I'll second. Motion and a second by Council Member Kalantari Johnson. Ms. Golder, you can open on your motion. Okay. So, as I was saying, I think that this is a great opportunity to try the one way. And I think starting with um, the level of urgency the, with what's happening around the affected neighborhoods. Um, and I'm wondering if we could move the timeline back and maybe have an emergency meeting of the Transportation and Public Works or Planning Commission and do a more expedited outreach just to get some traffic calming. And I don't know if that's possible. And so if it's not possible. I it seems like what you're going to be doing is potentially offering an amendment based on the response from Mr. Nguyen and Ms. It one or the other of you wish to comment on this? Happy to jump in on, uh, um, <clears throat> in response to that. Um, the emergency protective measures, temporary traffic control plans that were in place um, are, again, uh, an immediate response to the needs that are being addressed with recent failures. Now, the expansion of that temporary um, traffic control plan is, is, is partially what we're seeking with the pilot of the one way, but we can also uh, expand upon the temporary measures, meaning ad adding additional signage, exploring traffic calming measures. We still would need funding and to, to do those type of measures, but you know what's before you today is to explore 
uh, take this opportunity now to explore um, what could be done with Westcliff as we have these ongoing discussions through the many plans that we've discussed or brought uh, before council in years past. And so giving that opportunity to collect that data to help us again make these uh, informed decisions about what it might look like. So you think the May timeline is... That's why I, oh, sorry. What I'm trying to understand is, so with respect to the vice mayor's question about advancing or retarding the timeline and other meetings, that I think was the core of her question. The, the May return to council was dependent upon our need to go out to RFP for engineering services to be able to put the design and the plan together to be able to do the process and go and even then we abbreviated the response time to the RFP. So that is how that is baked in to be able to select a vendor, go through our purchasing processes and then do the data collection, the outreach and then return to council with the design. Based on that response from staff, would you like to make additional amendments to your motion? No, not at this time. Ms. Brown? Thank you. I guess I'm, I'm trying to follow up on the question to, and your response, uh, Mr. Wynn, uh, to see if there's a way to think about addressing the immediate concern that we're hearing. I think what you're saying is additional traffic, um, I don't know, if, if hardening of the, um, the side streets or signage. I mean, signage doesn't seem to be working, but maybe better signage, whatever those... You, you all know what those uh, um, measures might be. If some of that can happen in the interim, because the, we, I understand the plan's gonna take time and RFPs and all of that, but those are things that don't have to be part of the plan. You know, they, they can happen in the interim, I guess. So is that a possibility? And if so, do you need more direction? Do you need money? What is it that we would need to do to make that happen? Yeah, no, thank you for that uh, question. Councilmember Brown, and decoupling essentially what's been installed and the expansion of what we're, what we're seeking. I think we can take the two different timelines that we're talking about and have a more immediate response with evaluating the temporary traffic controls that are in place now and trying to harden, look for other uh, measures that can um, help mitigate the issues that some of the local uh, neighborhood traffic is, or, um, neighborhood is seeing. You know, enforcement could also be a part of that uh, component as well. And so uh, that would be one track that could happen more immediate, especially given the response that we're hearing uh, from the public today, but also that we're also ex wanting to explore um, keeping that on the table as far as what else could be the future for Westcliff. Councilmember Colin Tari Johnson. I had a yeah, similar comment question because um, we heard some very specific streets that have been impacted by Oxford, Alta, Plateau, David Way, and some specific suggestions with the water barriers and not a thorough street. So, um, and, and I, I'm not an expert and I don't know if those are the most effective ways to do it. So I would look to you all, but same as um, Council Member Brown, if we can, and I don't know if we need to have a friendly amendment. I think that's what you were maybe trying to go for is to add that in the interim that we address those specific needs in the next, I don't know, two to four weeks. Let me pause for just a moment here. I want to make sure that if that is an offer of an amendment that Ms. Bush has got that amendment. Do you have that? I have the print where I can catch the... Um, where, where are you placing? Is this... I, I don't know if it's needed. Question. If I may uh, chime in real quickly, Mayor, as you all weigh in on a potential friendly amendment, what I would just add, um, and I appreciate the, the question, Councilmember Kalantari Johnson, and Nathan uh, did a good job of speaking to it. What I would also add is um, I'll give a shout out to our transportation team that's sitting in the back row with us uh, today, but Matt Starkey and Claire have already been meeting regularly on site with neighbors in response to requests that are coming through. And so you're welcome to make it as a friendly amendment if, as you would like. I would just say that we continue to be committed to making interim uh, changes in response to concerns uh, that are being raised as we work through the process uh, for the pilot itself. So that work is ongoing. We will continue to, to expedite those projects as best we can. Again, taking a comprehensive look at how each one of these changes has in, ripple effects on the neighborhood as a whole. And so that's what the team has been doing. Then let me ask Ms. Kalantari Johnson as the maker of that potential friendly amendment, is that sufficient or would you like to have the amendment in? I think it's sufficient. Sufficient? Okay. Motion as 
stated with the changes by the vice mayor in her motion. Let me see if there are other questions. Are there other questions? Ms. Bruner? Um, so my question is, if, if you could pull up the motion again, there was some red line ad additional items that council member vice mayor Golder um, included and it makes it a little more specific based on some of the input we've received. Is there anything that falls out of those areas that's not included and, and should be? Because um, prior to those red line items, it was just around the West Cliff storm damage area. Now we're narrowing it down between certain streets. And I just want to make sure that we're not leaving anything out yeah, that was the... intended to be in there. Yeah, I appreciate the question, uh, Councilmember Bruner. I think the the additions that are being made do um, restrict the a study that we'd like to perform on West Cliff. We want it to be much more robust with not just the streets that have um, identified here in red, but into the neighborhood streets themselves. We we would ex expect and plan on doing traffic counts um, all the way through all the different neighborhood streets, all the way up to Delaware Street, so Oxford, Alto, Plateau, et cetera, as we look at expanding or exploring, I should say, um, a one-way pilot on West Cliff. The, the changes uh, that I see before us uh, today or right now do really narrow, I believe, narrow that focus down. And so uh, I think we would like to keep the options open by not narrowing by those streets uh, with these motions. And so that would be the request by, by staff. Thank you. Anyone else on this item? I was going to entertain a friendly amendment to that um, number three. Please offer it. Um, to uh, remove the red line streets that are listed there and just keep it um, around the West Cliff storm damage area. Well, I'm, I'm going to say this. I'm, the ruling on this is that that's, in my judgment, that's a substitute motion. That is not a motion to amend. I mean, the, unless the gentle lady sees it as a motion to amend. No, she doesn't. She doesn't accept it as a friendly amendment. If you would like to make a substitute motion, you're free to do so. I would like to make a substitute motion, um, as stated here um, on the screen. Okay. I, would this be an accurate way to characterize it? You're moving the staff recommendation. Um, because it's everything. You, However, you're she okay does with everything. My let me just finish. My, <laughs> I want to make sure I understand. You're, you're moving everything that was in the recommendation except the red lines. Only on number three. Only on number three. Okay, that's your substitute that. motion. Is there a second? Hearing none, the substitute Call motion it. fails for lack of a second. We are back on the motion in chief. Is there further debate or discussion on the motion? One other recommendation. And Please. I can't believe I'm going to say this because last time I suggested a enforcement, I was the first one that got pulled over for running the stop sign. <laughs> but can we get some people to do enforcement out there for running stop signs? And I'll stop. Uh, yeah. It costs I, like 300 bucks per ticket, and, and that can help fund some of this. I mean, we would work with SCPD to determine um, their capacity to come out and do traffic calming or enforcement as a part of the addition. The, um, detour that's been put in place. And so we can definitely seek that. Um, I, I don't want to speak for SCPD as far as um, their their workload and what, what can and can't be done at this time. Mr. Hufker, do you have a comment on that? I concur with Nathan's comments, but uh, we have been hearing uh, increased reports of folks running those stop signs and obviously concerns expressed this afternoon about the safety risk that poses to the neighborhood. So I'll have a chat with, uh, with Chief Escalante about how we can um, do some focused enforcement in those areas. Thank you, sir. Further debate or discussion? Seeing and hearing none, the clerk will call the roll on the motion. Council Member Newsom? Aye. Brown? Aye. Watkins? Aye. A Bruner? Aye. Kalantari Johnson? Aye. Vice Mayor Golder? Aye. And Mayor Keeley? Aye. Motion passes unanimously and so ordered. We are on item number 24. Uh, this is a resolution to annex parcels at 538 Center Street into parking district number one. 
and a resolution to accomplish that. Good That's afternoon. Me. How good. are you? I'm great. Thank you. How are you? It's good to see you. Yeah. How, uh, how, how are you, Judge? Okay. And took I, a couple days. You yeah. may <laughs> furrow your brow, Mr. Condotti, and wonder why maybe she was elevated to the court by the governor, but she was actually a judge of the clam chowder cook-up. <laughs> uh, so I, I know you were worried there for a moment. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I'm Claire Glogley, transportation planner for the city of Santa Cruz. The item before you returns from the notice of intent that you saw at the last council meeting. It's a quick cleanup item to annex in three parcels to the downtown parking district so that the Cavalry Church Affordable Housing Project can move forward with all of their um, entitlements, get their APN numbers and other necessary cleanups. If you have any questions, I'm available. Questions or comments? Anyone? Anyone looking around? No questions or comments. Matter is back before the council. A motion to approve would be in order. I'll make the motion. There is a motion. I'll second. I'll second I, by I, Ms. Brown. Do we need public comment? I think we'll, we'll get right there. Uh, this is the opportunity to comment on this item before we go to a vote. Seeing and hearing none. Matter is back before the council. Debate and discussion. Seeing and hearing none. We are, uh, I think what we will do Bear with me for just a moment. We are only on the resolution. Very good. This this will be sufficient. We can do it on one motion. Clerk will call the roll. Sorry, who was the maker? And then who was the second? Uh, the maker was Mr. Newsom. The second was Ms. Brown. Thank you. Councilmember Newsom. Aye. Brown? Aye. Watkins? Aye. Brunner? Aye. Kalantari Johnson? Aye. Vice Mayor Golder? Aye. And Mayor Keeley? Aye. Motion passes and so ordered. Let me ask if there's any further business to come before the council this afternoon or this evening. Seeing and hearing none, a motion to adjourn would be... Uh, we do have oral communications. We do have oral communication. Anyone with us this evening, this afternoon, wish to provide oral communication? Please come forward. And Ms. Bush, while the gentleman's coming forward, anyone online? We do, okay. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Mayor, uh, City Council. Um, I'm concerned about the lack of representation, the fact that uh, we have three powerful organizations that the public knows nothing about. They're not taught about any of this uh, in either your uh, grade schools, high schools, or colleges. Uh, one is AMBAG. AMBAG is a regional agency uh, that is funded by the United Nations and the World Bank. Uh, they're called COGS, Councils of Government. They're no more than a Soviet. And if your uh, chamber is like the Board of Supervisors or the other 13 cities and three counties uh, just in uh, AMBAG area alone, uh, you're not reporting to the people all the activities that go on, and you do not, and you refuse to pay for community TV to address this. The other powerful organization was founded, uh, it's an extension of common cause. It was a Rockefeller family put that together. It's called California Forward. The co-chair of that is Leon Panetta, who gave military and policy information to a red Chinese communist spy called Hugh DeLacy, and you've got two monuments on the courthouse steps uh, relating to him. Uh, the third one is Civonomics, uh, which was uh, put together by, uh, as you can see, uh, this city council totally was involved, as was uh, uh, Mr. Don Lane, who gave the key to the city of this city to Communist Angela Davis when she was, uh, she was, she had run for vice president of the Communist Party under, with Gus Hall, who called for the butchering of Christ Christian children, which is not unlike the cremation of care which uh, is done uh, through Bohemian Grove. Bohemian Grove is an extension of the Commonwealth uh, Foundation, uh, which has had a number of you people uh, as, as guests, and the Commonwealth uh, Foundation, together with Irvine and Packard. Packard's a member of the Trilateral Commission. Irvine uh, uh, also funded uh, the California Forward, which is in compared to a magazine talking about disorder, uh, along with the Revolutionary Communist Party and the Communist Party itself, 
talks about California Forward as being involved with that. Uh, the keynote for, speaker. For about five yes. seconds. Thank you. That, that was three minutes. Okay. Thank you. No, no. If you wanted to take a couple seconds and wrap up, that's fine. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, anyway, I think it's really important uh, that people get the information through community TV, know the interest in the huge, powerful groups behind these regional organizations. A COG, a Council of Government, is no more than a Soviet. Uh, so uh, please press on representing government. Thank you. Thank you very much. Anyone else with us wish to provide? Please come forward. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Mayor Keeley and council members. Um, my name is Rhonda Reyna, and I and my daughter were the victims of severe domestic violence in this community. 4,000 children a day are being family court kidnapped by corrupt judges who are violating our rights secured by the Constitution. Three of these children were videotaped in one neighborhood three blocks away from each other. Those videos have gone viral around the world and have been seen over 30 million times. And I'm very deeply disappointed by the lack of empathy by this council and city staff here um, every time I've tried to seek help. I have this document that is a representation of then uh, Mayor Brenner and Coonerty making a statement that if we saw teachers or police officers or security guards grabbing and violently removing kids like this, there would be serious consequences. But to date, nothing has happened. And as of now, there are two more children in Utah who are barricaded in their home trying to um, avoid um, removal by violence with police officers to take them to reunification camps. I have sought help from Mr. Huffaker, who is in charge of our wing of VAWA here, but all my emails and uh, points of contact have been categorically ignored. I've done records requests to find out um, what the VAWA funding is, and to date I've received no receipts for that, even though I asked. I've been learning about the city structure and government structure, and I understand that everybody is supposed to have faithful performance bonds. Um, it's in your city charter, section 1301, and um, California state law requires bonds to be held under 1450 to 1450. 60.1 inclusive to include crime insurance policy, employee dishonesty insurance, and faithful performance bonds. But I've been told that none of you hold those and no city members do. So I would like you to explain why none of you are bonded and why nobody is helping me with this problem of getting these children rescued. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Bush, anyone else online? Just one person. Thank you. Good afternoon. The person online, good afternoon. Yes, hello. This is Barrett again. The state of California has ended its COVID emergency declaration today as of February 28th. There certainly are cities in California that have already lifted emergency declarations like Long Beach. I have no idea what's your excuse. Maybe you like the emergency powers. There is really no excuse next meeting. While the COVID emergency is over and it's time to give that up, I would mention Biden plans to sell out the sovereignty of the United States to the wannabe globalist unelected dictatorship WHO by joining a pandemic treaty, giving the WHO authority in matters of pandemics to control U.S. policy response, including your doctor's treatments, government regulations such as lockdowns and vaccine mandates, global supply chains, and monitoring and surveillance of populations. You should consider opposing that as if everybody's freedom and health depended on it when it comes up, as it will, well, I'll bet you won't. While the COVID emergency has been over since mid-2021, the enormous excess death rate of young working people, despite or because of the all-too-coincident vaccine mandate rollout, has not ended. Maybe removing the stale COVID emergency status will help combat the unnecessary, potentially deadly vaccinations of young working people, as that is, to me, the likely cause of excess deaths. I'll comment uh, on commission appointments of last meeting. That section F in the ordinance you approved has no place in statutory law. And I mentioned Texas has recently banned DEI consideration in all hiring. We should too. 
implied bias in hiring was removed in symphony auditions by using blind additions, excluding other irrelevant aspects of the person playing. Symphony quality musicians are extraordinarily rare, and the last way to assemble an orchestra would be loaded according to demographic quotas. Nobody would pay to hear that mediocrity. The only diversity I care about is the sum total diversity of thought, ability, knowledge, and skill a candidate possesses to perform the duties of commissioner. We wanted to add a standard protected... That's not three minutes, is it? <laughs> no. Uh, Sir, that was... That was two minutes which is know, oral communication is two oh, minutes. Oh I see I got it you did down to two. Well you missed a good part then. Oh well. <laughs> Maybe next time. Thanks. Thank you. Anyone else? Anyone else with us on oral communication? Seeing and hearing none. A motion to adjourn would be in order. Shockingly, the vice mayor <laughs> moves for adjournment and Ms. Brown seconds. Non-debatable, those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, motion carries its award. We stand adjourned. Richard Arnold goes.